Well, I started photography when I was a junior in high school. I could believe I was a junior. This was in the early, early 50s. Some locals decided that they'd rip me off, and they did. They stole all my guns, my rifle and shotguns, and I had a pistol. And it was gone. My mother gave me a check she got from the insurance company for $160, and I bought a twin lens camera. I don't know why I bought the camera. I just don't know. Paul? Uh, this is Peter Miller calling. You? I'm good. It's taken a while for me to get going, but... And then sometimes I just went out of the way to meet them, and they knew who I was and why my family came up and where we're living and, and what are you doing? They were curious. And I got along with these people very well. And one of them was Will and Rowena Austin, who lived across the valley. I could see their house from our house. When I first went up there, the two of them were on the porch. And uh, Rowena was rocking and her husband was there with a pipe, Will, smoking his pipe. I just walked up and I said, hi. Oh, I sat down on the porch and we started talking and they knew me. And I had the Roloflex, I had this, or a camera like this, it wasn't this one, but it was very much like that. And you can take this camera and you can go like this. set up the background, have me fix the lights, and uh, then he would stand on the side and talk to the people and take the pictures. And he got the reactions from them, and the, he tried to capture their personality. He didn't try to do what Hollywood does and make fun of them or make them some sort of creature. He tried to capture their humanity, and he did a very good job of it. And so I learned from that, but I said, I don't want to photograph famous people. It's, no, I'm more interested in street photography. I was a GI, a Signal Corps photographer, and I lived in the center of Paris, and I went around, and I just went out and found Paris, and so my education was Paris. It was, it, I, but I learned stuff in the university, but 
I learned everything from that city. I learned about light, I learned about the museums, I learned about the Impressionists, I learned about wine, good food. I learned about cities, I learned everything. And then I went to New York and realized that photography is a little weak in one way. They said that a photograph's worth 10,000 words. That's not true. Maybe there's 10 photographs worth 10,000 words, some of them worth a million words, particularly those shot in Vietnam. But <clears throat> mostly, no. You have to know what's going on. And that's why I, I went to Life magazine, because they combine text about the subject and big photographs, so you could go back and forth. And that's where I realized that the writing is very important, and I went to life to learn that. And it took a while, but I did learn it. And I think about it, as I remember talking with a friend of mine. He said, Peter, when we're ready to go, you shoot me, I'll shoot you. I, yeah, I've had several people say to me, the best thing that can happen is we can drop on the floor and that's it. Yeah. Because, uh, as far as any kind of, <clears throat> and that very likely is what will happen, I, who knows. Uh, but I think about that more and more now. Got my byline in life and uh, after one story I wrote about 13 times and the editor kept turning it down and finally I said, oh the hell with it. And uh, I picked it up after a couple weeks, and then I just wrote it again and gave it to him. He said, it's perfect, what'd you do? And I said, I dropped it. And then I just picked it up and wrote it real quick. He said, well, you're a writer now. And they published it, and I quit. Subconsciously, I knew I didn't belong. So I, I came back to Vermont, I had two young kids, a beautiful place to live, and I, all of a sudden I was not, I was just a nobody. I was, had the best job in journalism. I gave it up to come back to Vermont. I left life and I came up to Vermont and uh, I had two kids and I realized Vermont's a very good place for kids. Because of my brother, I moved up to Northern Vermont. I did start that ski magazine or at least the editorship of it and he ran the business out of it. And that went kerflui in 1968 when a lot of other businesses went down. And now I got divorced. The magazine went broke, I got divorced. I didn't have a son, I had nothing. And that's when Ted Ross, my friend, uh, we did a lot of skiing together and, and hunting. We, particularly we hunted and fished together. And he, uh, he said, look at the bright side of this. You got your car, you got your fishing rod, you got your shotgun, you got your dog. You don't need anything else. <laughs> I started working for Ski Magazine, and I started going down to New York regularly to work and get more clients for writing and photography, and I started to travel a bit, and then I traveled more and more and traveled more and more, and then I traveled all the time. And after a while, I just got tired of it. I'd wake up, I didn't know where I was. At, down in New York, there was, I met people, I said, hey, we started a new business with uh, photography on uh, stock photography. We're gonna sell to businesses. Why don't, why don't you join us? I said, well, why not? And they said, they told us. So I started shooting pictures in New York, shooting pictures in Vermont, giving to them. I ended up one of their better photographers. And uh, they said, you're, you're sort of in between graphic and art. And he said, but you're doing well. I didn't know that. And the editor I had, uh, Jean, his French, he, when I came back from a trip to India, he said, your pictures are no good. Why are you doing this? You shouldn't do this stock stuff. You have more talent than that. Uh, 
he really gave me a lacing. And then I uh, thought about it, and I came back to Vermont, and I said, you know, I went to Life magazine to learn how to write, and I learned layout at the same time. And I knew photography. I knew that as a, from high school. It was just natural to me. So I said, well, I'm going to do some books. And that's when I started the um, Vermont People book. And I was told by everybody I was going to fail. People up who were familiar with books and publishing that I knew, I don't do that, Peter. You just, that's too regional. You're not going to do anything. And everybody was telling me, what a stupid idea. And then I was going to do it in black and white photographs of people, Vermonters, and no colored leaves, and no red barns, and no nothing like that. I, I couldn't find a publisher. Thirteen publishers turned me down. And uh, I went to a bank. I said, hey, would you lend me some money? They did. They lent me enough money on my house, of course, to get enough money to get that book going. And I started the book, and I found out because of the photography I'd done, I'd always done black and white for myself, and always portraits. And I think it might be something I picked up from Yusuf Kars when I worked for him. I found out I didn't have enough for a book. I went out and shot more portraits. And I interviewed the people, and I listened and looked and so forth. And I did short pieces. It's all two pages at least of each person. Big photograph and write-up. And the write-up was real journalistic lifestyle, right to the point. It was a good book. And it was a hardcover. And then I tried to sell it to some of the bookstores, and they said, did you self-publish this book? I said, yes, we don't take self-published books. It's like I came from the wrong side of the tracks. It meant that I, was, I was, had a lousy book that wasn't edited or done correctly and so forth. Vermont Life said it'll take you 10 years to sell 2,000 books. Some people look at it, this is interesting, I'll take some. All of a sudden, whammo. I was delivering cases of books night after night over to Burlington, up to Stowe, and down to Vermont, southern Vermont. The book came out, I think it was two and a half, three months, and it was 3,000 were sold out. It's just gone. I had to reprint. I reprinted, and 15,000 eventually were sold. And I could have sold more, but I just said, that's enough. And uh, from there, I did other books. And some of the books of Vermont farm women did well. I did the Plains book. I lost my shirt on that. It cost me a lot of money. And that's when I came back to Vermont. I said, I'm going to stick with Vermont. I'm going to stay as small as I can. Because uh, uh, money was never the attraction for me. It's basically doing what I like to do, which is photography and writing. Really, if, if you keep that wood fire going, and of course my wife, she got used to the heat. So now, goddamn, if it drops below 75, she's freezing, and of course she's tall and slim, so. The old Vermonters used to keep it at 80 degrees. Oh, God, the bastard, yeah. Especially in the kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, all right. So what are we going to do here? Well, we're going to sit down, and we're going to talk. Okay. And... I'm going to figure out where you go, where I go. When I first meet somebody, unless it's a spur of the moment type thing, it's just one photograph, I usually say, hey, I want to come up and visit with you. Now, that's a Vermont term. I want to visit. Now, that means sitting down in the kitchen or someplace and talking. And that's what I do. We were dirt poor over in Newbury and... Uh... She, I forget, oh, I know, she knew, she went to a, the bank in Wells River, that little bank in Wells River, and which isn't even the town, it's a village in the town of Newbury on the Connecticut River. And she knew that the guy had a kid, so she called someone about this guy's little boy and it found out it was his birthday, so you she took with somebody and you're doing an interview, 
you better let them talk. Don't lead them because you're sitting there and then all of a sudden things just sort of nothing said or something and you're just sitting there. All of a sudden that person, man or woman, was, well, and then they'll start and sometimes they'll take a, a left turn. And there's another story, and there's the story. You keep your mouth shut until it's finished. You might direct it a little bit. I said, oh, tell me more about that. You know, I've come back from some interviews, absolutely exhilarated what I learned, or what was said. I got a story. I knew I had a story. I don't know what, how you know that. Maybe I learned it in Life Magazine when I was reporting. I had a story. And I found out that my stories don't have to be big stories or little ones. You gotta dig a bit. The fun part is interviewing people and taking pictures. People like my photography probably because it's simple. It's not confusing. And uh, maybe it's what I pictures I take. I have a picture of a cow. People love it. I have a picture of a of a certain people that just happen to become icons of Vermont. And I take, I don't know, I take a bunch of pictures and they're pretty good. And I look at some of them, I take it, see, they have, that ought to be five feet tall and ten feet wide, but there's nobody up here going to buy a picture like that. Besides, I can't afford to do it. Well, when I first started, it was just, I sort of winged it, and uh, I didn't take many notes with a tape recorder. I do now, because one, I find people are saying, I didn't say that, and I know. The other reason, I want to catch the feeling of they're full of conversation. Sometimes just a sentence, but other times it's a flow. And my writing is a flow with it. And I have to put that together. And I have to do it fairly quickly. Like I write once, I read it, and I write again. I read his notes or her notes, and I do it again. And, I, and then I put it down, I read it again. And it's got to have this flow. The Irish comes out in me. And it's all the Irish, because the Irish are sort of poets in a way, the way they flow words. And I can do the same. And I like to get the feeling of the people in there. What I learned from Jean down there in New York is you all, we all have talent, but if you don't take responsibility for your talent, you've messed up. And he's right. You have to do the best you can with what you have. And I have mediocre talent, but I have a lot of drive. And that's because that's one reason the books are done. I don't quit. Snapshot. Sound's got to be down. It's too bright out. Not even worth a tripod. <laughs> That's the only thing I really wanted to do was to communicate. That's what it is. It's, it, when I look at it, to communicate. I think there are other things down below that I did it because it's getting into other people's lives or maybe I don't have a much respect for my own life and, and I live vicariously with these people or I don't have many friends, but all my friends are the people I photograph. Maybe that's another thing I do, is I learn from these people. I learn, I learn about their living. Maybe it is I live vicariously. My life is really quite boring. But there, it's through them that, that maybe my life is, I don't know, I've never really thought about it.